in my opinion, the components of success really are, um, it's important to define your vision for your team, um, define the vision for your technology, but also be flexible. Um, I think that in order to be successful, you have to be ready to pivot if an oppor opportunity presents itself. Uh, persistence is very important in this industry, in this, in this um, going down this career path, starting a company, commercializing a technology. Um, persistence, but also maintaining focus is, is really important as well. If you, wind, if you wind up with the lottery ticket of entrepreneurship and your business succeeds wildly, um, awesome. But that's not the normal case. Even if the business that you launched doesn't succeed in getting to scale, uh, what you take away from that is a unique set of skills that will serve you your entire career. Um, I look at the skills I learned in graduate school and uh, initially applied those to build uh, new enterprises within the university. And then essentially kind of uh, jump back and forth between starting companies and building other enterprises uh, within the university system. So it really becomes, in many ways, that set of skills becomes a, a new, new world outlook uh, that allows you to look at something and say, I could do that better, or we could improve on that. We just need to build a plan on it, bring in the resources, build the team, and figure out how to get it to scale. That's a very valuable set of skills, whether they produce a... Um, wildly successful technical company or allow you to build really impactful programs with the within the university system. Since we finished the R2M, uh, we, we really formally organized the company. We went out, we recruited and, and hired a, a very capable CEO. Uh, and, uh, and we've had uh, pretty good success so far in having a number of customers that are interested in what we're doing, and and uh, we're right now. I think we're in a in a pretty big growth phase. We're we're looking to recruit more employees to the company, and and uh, and sort of dealing with uh, dealing with the interest. And it's really it, it's it's also something that because. The kind of climate change mitigation and and uh, and 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 interest in in low carbon footprint products and things of this nature that that our company is directly involved with in providing the kind of quantification tools for uh, we're finding there's a lot of interest even internationally so we're we're having uh, conversations right now with with several companies about setting up international projects and and so we're. Uh, uh, we've we've got a, a huge amount on our plate right now, but I think we again we're we've been uh, uh, fortunate in having to having gone through myself and and two of our co-founders going through the R2M pro program really I think helped us prepare for the uh, and and deal with the 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 growth phase and the the interest in the 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 work with the company so far. My advice to faculty and grad students and postdocs who are interested in starting company are, first of all, to, to think about it from a person perspective. The people in the company are probably more important than the idea itself. I, I've learned throughout my, my time that a, that a great idea with bad people doesn't go anywhere, but a so-so a idea with great people goes a lot further. So think about the people that are, that are involved uh, in the process. The second thing to, to keep in mind is that just because you think you've got a, an idea that's got a product and a market, you really don't know until somebody outside of, of your close friend network is willing to buy that. And so taking the time to do voice of customer activities and figure out if there really is a market really is important before you determine if you've really got a product that somebody else will buy. I think knowing your market sooner is like a like the ideal thing to have. And you can do that through customer discovery. But I think customer discovery is really a numbers game. Um, and I mean, we've, we've probably talked to over 300 people and we're still figuring it out, um, which is a good thing. That's not, that's not, that's not a bad thing. So, I, I mean, I think that's just tough, right? Like, uh, let's, let's think about all the markets. We went from windows to roof coatings to automotive to cosmetics, to 
applications through printing. So we have color that can be printed. You could break down printing into like flexographic, rotogravure, um, industrial inkjet, screen printing, et cetera. You can break down automotive to OEM in aftermarket. You break, break down architectural coatings into decorative versus performance. You can, I mean, so there's all these, these like routes that you can go into. So it's kind of a cop out to say, like, I wish I knew our market sooner because we have a lot of opportunities there and it just takes time to explore all that. And you only have so many man hours. Why most young companies fail is because they do not validate an appropriate customer segment for their services or technologies that they're developing and they get so far down a road where we find out it's the wrong path because of the gap of doing that discovery diligence and then they fail. Engaging with the courage to ask those customers, what do you like about my technology? What could it do better? And does it bring you value? allows us as entrepreneurs and inventors to fit our technology and our ideas with success into a marketplace. Uh, and, and finally, I think uh, it helps us understand that um, getting out of the office, which is one of the mantras of that program, uh, really has almost no downsides. So you need to understand where your little idea and business is going to sit in that broader ecosystem that you're trying to make a contribution to. One thing that's helped me in my journey a lot is not being afraid to ask for stuff. Um, I would say that both myself and my co-founder are relentless on asking for things. And I, I guess that sounds maybe entitled by, by saying it, but um, one thing my grandma always said is like, how are people going to know you want something unless you ask for it? And that's been absolutely key in trying to gain uh, knowledge for all these different roles that we need to take on. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. For most of us that start companies based off technology we've developed, we are really in love with our technology and we, we know what its strengths are. But I think the biggest factor in determining whether or not something will be a commercial success or a business success is actually the business team. It's, it's not necessarily the technology. So there are many great examples of companies that had maybe mediocre technology but were commercially successful. There are also a lot of examples of companies that had great technology but not enough strength on the business side. And so I think uh, for me as a, an academic, as a professor, um, I know how to do that kind of work. And so finding the right people that knew how to do the new business development was really, really critical. Um, and I would say it took me quite a while to find the right team on that side. What I've learned above everything else in this company and before is that the only way you can really fail is if you stop trying. Engaging with people, collecting that data, and continuing to push forward always prevails, in my, opinion, in my opinion, in my experience. That's the attitude of success, of drive, of grit that you have to have, you have to have to have when you're starting a company. One of the, the goals that I'm working on is I've gone from being a technical person to doing what I'd call business development and more recently, I've taken on the role of marketing and sales, um, all of the roles I like. Um, and, and soon, I, I'd also say, I guess I'm doing legal too, to, to a degree. Um, but what, one thing that we're doing is we're starting to quote companies on our projects. So we have our business model that we're working on. Our business model is a partnership model where we are trying to partner to go to market. We have all these different verticals that we can hit that are somewhat differentiated in like a technical standing. And we know our core product is an additive and we understand how to formulate it. So that's our, our value is we can make this stuff and then we can tell you how to mix it into your existing systems to a degree. So one thing that we've started working on is to be able to partner with people. They want to kick the tires. They want to see if it works. 
So I've developed these sample kits, as we call them, where we give them low quantities of our material. And then we also give them consulting advice, like free formulation help, essentially, to see if it works in their existing systems. That was a huge game changer is just changing like how we can engage with customers. So we knew we didn't want to give them free samples, but we thought that going right to a partnership for six figure deals is obviously too much of a jump because they need to get that internal champion, uh, that internal um, um, agreement that that's where they want to go. So one thing that we found though, is that there's a lot of like, we have our boilerplate quote for the sampler kit. And there's a lot of like companies want to put their own legal terms. They want to negotiate this. So one thing that's that that I'm learning right now is when to use lawyers and the importance of them and kind of what language you can and cannot change. And I'm not really sure how you can teach that outside of like trying to see more documents. But one thing is I've been hesitant to use lawyers. And in some cases that slowed us down a lot. So we've been like, at a standstill with a company that wants to give us a pretty decent amount of money just because we tried to negotiate something up front and uh, uh, the terms that we initially thought we could go, our lawyers were like, we, sh we shouldn't do it that way. And it's just, it's, it's really stalled out in negotiation. So to kind of put in, in like a, a summary, like our willingness to use lawyers or our willingness to uh, involve counsel early uh, has has been a slowing down uh, of being able to generate some revenue. One of the exciting things about founding a company as an academic scientist is that I, I it brought me back to a steep learning curve. Every day, I, five years in, I continue to learn so much about the world and about um, how how people make decisions, what's happening out outside of the academic walls. And it's really influenced what I do in my academic work as well. So I've applied a lot of the principles of the lean startup approach and customer discovery to my research and my administrative role here at the university. I see in this new generation of students a real desire to have an impact on the world. Uh, that can come from living an exemplary life, from uh, making an individual contribution through something like the Peace Corps. In the case of the Peace Corps, you can have direct impact on a small group of people. Um, you can also look at the other end of the bookend and think about taking a solution and bringing it to scale and potentially impacting the lives of millions of people. Um, both are um, laudable uh, goals and both uh, are worthy of pursuit. But uh, there can be a real difference of scale um, that you can achieve through entrepreneurship. 